Okay, comrades, this talk is probably the silliest talk of Marxism this year, so uh, since it's about something that doesn't exist. Um, I've just been giving you a talk on Hegel, so you know, it really is it's about spirit, as it were. Uh, you're trying to communicate with a particular spirit, which is that of the dead Marx. Now, Marx's capital is an unfinished work. I mean, just historically, volume one is the only volume published which Marx actually saw go to press, work through to the press. Volumes two and three were left in manuscript, Engels worked on them, and for the large part of the rest of Engels' life, in fact, he worked on volumes two and three and got them out before he died. Um, we also have something sometimes known as volume four, which itself, if you buy it, is in three books, called The Theories of Surplus Value, sometimes known as volume four. Now, it's clear from writings of Marx, including bits in the Grundrisse and various letters he wrote to people at the time that he was drafting Capital, that he did plan to write a great deal more. In fact, one plan, um, the one I'll, I'll stick to, because there are various ones, but the one I'll stick to, he planned five additional volumes. Um, and they were to be on specific subjects. They were to be on landed property, uh, wage labor, the state, international trade, and the world market. And they would have been very interested. Um, now, something just to say about those, that scheme. Firstly, one of the books, I think we can say, the one on landed property, which was in his original scheme, I think we can say that he did write it. And you'll find it in the last part, towards the end, of Volume 3. There's a whole section on rent. And probably, for Marx's purposes, the general purposes, that section on rent covers Marx's essential concerns. Comrades might ask a question, which somebody asked me yesterday when I was chatting to them about what I was going to try to do today. They might ask, well, why didn't Marx also include a volume on ideology? And, to the, you know, because you think, well, he's going to write about everything in the end. Why doesn't he have a volume on ideology? After all, if you were at a modern polytechnic, you know, getting handouts about this, um, you'd expect to have a course on ideology, a special subject. And I think the answer is quite simply because, actually, that would be to misrepresent Marx's purpose. I think you'd have a special volume on ideas, on ideology. Because if you look at the work, Capital, as he has it, it is all the way through, it is a work on ideology. It, the title, the subtitle is A Critique of Political Economy, a critique of all the ideas which have so far been developed about how capitalism works. The very first sentence of Chapter 1, Volume 1, says something to the effect that the wealth of ca in, in the capitalist form of society appears to take the form of commodities. It doesn't say it does, it says it, it appears to. And all the way through the three volumes, uh, at different points in the development of the argument, there's a contrast going on between how things are in essence and how they appear to be. How wages appear to be fair, but actually behind the seeming fairness of the wages system is the process of exploitation, and so on. All the way through to the end. The last chapter, which is unfinished, of volume three on classes, says, it seems to be the case that classes are defined in terms of the origin of revenue, but, and here the manuscript breaks off. <laughs> now, so he didn't need a volume on ideology, I think. Now, the question is, though, about the other ones. Because wage labor is missing, the state is missing, according to what he wrote. And uh, international trade in the world market, treat those as one, for the sake of the argument. I don't know what he would have, how he would have distinguished between those. Perhaps he had something special in mind that I don't know about. Now, what I want to do is to talk about the missing books. Now, that really is a silly project. It's rather like asking, what would Beethoven's 11th Symphony have sounded like? Um, and, you, you know, if you aren't in the mood to be silly, you know, <laughs> be, be sensible. Um, but I want to argue that in terms of Marx's own criteria, the book is incomplete, and that those books are needed, in a sense. And it's a silly proposition that you can't understand, you know, Lenin said, you know, you can't understand Marx's capital unless you've read Hegel's logic. I'm going to say, you can't understand the first three volumes of capital unless you've understood the other three that he didn't write. Um, now, <laughs> and the reason for saying this is, firstly, that it's possible, without some grasp of why it's not complete, in some ways, the book as we have it is open to misinterpretation of various kinds, and considering, in a sense, what's missing, and trying to think about it a bit, is to do that is to see that there's some potential for further theoretical development and work that we ourselves all need to do. 
in terms of the development of Marx's own ideas. From his own starting point, there's a lot of work for us to do. It's obvious, as soon as you think, we're the group that believes in the theory of state capitalism. You won't find it, except there's hints of it in Marx's capital, but how is it possible? You know, for the picture you get, you know, 19th century capitalism, is capitalism is about private property, meaning belonging to individuals and so on, still. Still largely the picture with which she's working, except for a few remarks in the chapter, which are not really very much developed in volume three. Now, just a few assumptions, uh, which I'll state without defending them in particular, just to sort of set the scene before I actually go on to volume four, or volume five, however you want to number it, the book on wage labor. Marx's aim was to produce in theory a theoretical account of capitalist society, of the whole, what Hegel had called the totality, of the big picture of the whole of the world in the capitalist period. That was his essential concern. And to try to grasp capitalist society in the term which he used in um, the Grundrisse, he says, to try to grasp it as an organic whole where all the parts fit together. Try and see the whole in terms of the, all its parts and the way they fit together. <coughs> and to give an account of capitalism so that it would be entirely explicable in terms of the presuppositions of the theory itself. So you'd have an entirely consistent theoretical account where you didn't need to draw on something, so, secretly snitch something in from outside to explain it. You, might, you, know, you, you wouldn't need to draw in the will of God to explain how the whole system worked. You wouldn't need to have some covert theory about um, individuals, like Adam Smith has, to make his whole system work. Individuals, he says, have got, are born with a natural propensity to uh, trade. You know, babies in the pot, you know, they're wanting to coin it right from the start. I mean, that, that's there in, in Smith. There's a hidden presupposition which is outside his system. Marx wants a completely consistent system which is entirely dependent on its own presuppositions in a sense. Now, the method of presentation, secondly, by which he proceeds in capital is, and this is to enormously oversimplify, but he explores the social relationships of capitalist society, and that's his concern, the social relationships of capitalist society. He explores them by starting with what he sometimes calls the most fundamental or sometimes the most simple relationship. He starts with the commodity. Chapter 1, Volume 1. He starts with the commodity. He explores that and its implications and its internal contradictions. And, what, and then, having explored that, he shows that you must progress from there. And if we move on to money, exchange, and money, and to capital, and the forms of and everything, gradually there's an elaboration outwards to exploring the implications of each stage of the argument, and moving, in another set phrase which he uses, from the most abstract to the most concrete, the most general to the particular, if you like. And the whole movement of the work is in, takes that form. And he looks at things one aspect at a time, and he looks at one aspect of it, and then he looks at another aspect. And gradually, he tries to build up a picture, and if the work had ever, was ever completed, and no doubt it would have run to... The Encyclopedia Britannica you know, would have been a footnote, as it were. It would have encompassed the whole history of capitalism, and the whole class struggling capitalism, and if it had been completed at the right time, the overthrow. And then it would have been the total account of capitalism. Now... Lastly, and uh, most controversially, that, I think that's fairly straightforward, but the last and controversial thing I want to say is that fundamentally he wasn't using what we conventionally call a causal analysis, um, in which you first of all describe the, the elements that cause things to happen, and then afterwards you describe the effects, you know, in some sort of mechanical sense. You pull one lever and something else happens. That sort, not that sort of picture of interconnection between things, rather um, not the base causing the superstructure, for example. I was sitting in a restaurant yesterday with a couple of the comrades from, from Canada, and we decided to form a new society, the uh, Society of the Materialist Enemies at the Base and the Superstructure. Um, and you're only allowed to join if you've wrestled with them and partially overcome them. Um, uh, Chris Harmon is forbidden, you know. Um, and we're not sure about anybody else. The, um, but instead, one relationship in some sense entails another one, and there's an exploration of something and how it entails another development and so on. So there's that sort of notion of the connection between one thing and another. Okay, that's probably controversial, but I'll try and make it work. Okay, now, wage labor. The book on wage labor. Rozdolsky, in his book, The Making of Marx's Capital, says, actually, Marx did write the book on wage labor, and he did include it in what we have. There is the discussion of wages and so on. And I want to argue that in terms of Marx's own presuppositions, he didn't. 
Now, I'm freely confessed, everybody is a thief, and I am as big a thief as anybody. I stole the next bit of the argument uh, from a brilliant article by a Canadian Marxist called Michael J. Leibowitz. And you'll find it in the Review of Radical Political Economy. I think it's been published now. I saw a photocopy of it. And I pitched the next bit of my argument, so you can blame Michael J. Leibowitz of uh, Vancouver for this. Anyway, and here we come to the pictures. Okay. Now, starting off, Mark, when Marx talks about capital, I think this is not as difficult as it, it might seem. Marx says, what is capital? It's money in movement, in a sense. Uh, it's, it's value in movement. It, you start off with money, the most fundamental form. I mean, anybody, can talk, but anybody, anybody can remember this. You start with money. Money is exchanged for commodities, and those commodities are then sold for more money. And the most fundamental movement of capital is M to C to bigger M, M plus. Money buys commodities, commodities are sold for a larger amount of money. That is the, the, the fundamental formula of capital. That's what capital is in its most essential sense. M, C, big M, bigger M. And he says, well, then goes on to say um, that, of course, the most historic, historically, the most significant form of capital is what he calls industrial capital. We might call it productive capital. Um, and we have to ask the question, he asked, and I think everybody's familiar with this argument, he says, how does capital achieve the trick of growing by changing its form, it, exchanging itself for commodities and then coming out bigger, as, mu as a bigger piece of money again? And his answer is, of course, and uh, I imagine if people don't know the lettering, uh, the, the, the way of representing it, at least they know the idea probably, most comrades here will, will have some idea of this, he says, the capitalist invests his money, buys means of production, raw materials, machinery, and so on, he also buys labor power. He buys those two things, and he puts them together in his factory, and he makes them work for him. And at the end of the day, because the labor power is capable of producing more value than it costs, through the process of production, more commodities worth more than the capitalists invest in the first place are produced at the end of the day. The worker produces surplus value that is embodied in those uh, commodities at the end of the day, and then the capitalist sells, and he ends up with more money than he began with. So from MCM, we then move, and you can actually, here we come to the first circle. We, I've simply, it's a circuit, he talks about it as a circuit of capital. It goes round and round in a sort of spiral. So we talk about it as a circuit. Start with money at the top, M. He exchanges it for commodities, means of production, and labor power. There's then the process of production represented by the dotted line. At the end of the process of production, you've got commodities worth more, which are sold for money again. Okay, everybody, even if you don't know the notation, which is the usual one, you know the idea. Okay? Fine. One problem with this, because Marx is trying to produce an account of a system in which, as he puts it in the Grundrisse, every effect is also a presupposition, and every presupposition is also an effect. Hegelian language. Never mind. One, put it this way, one of the things in that circuit isn't produced in the circuit. You see, the means of production are produced by other capitalists. He buys them from other capitalists. They're produced by capital, in a sense. They are capital when he buys them, in a sense. Labor power is not produced under the aegis of capital. Now, the worker doesn't produce his labor power. It comes into the system from outside. But Marx is trying to produce a system in which there's nothing outside, an account in which there's nothing outside his system. Everything must be explained in terms of the system. Now, perhaps I can make this clearer by saying that we need something else in capital. We need another circuit. It's a very simple circuit. It's the circuit of wage labor. And it goes like this. We'll start off the same place as the capitalists. We'll start off with some money in our pockets, or our wallets, or our handbags. We start off with some money, and we go and buy, we're workers, we go and buy some articles of consumption, and here they're called AC, for articles of consumption, okay? There's this circuit on the outside, this time we're going around, we start off with money wages, we spend them on articles of consumption, then we consume those articles of consumption, right? Whether it's uh, living in the house, we're renting or mortgaging, or um, eating the food, or wearing the clothes, or having a holiday, whatever it is, we, it isn't, as Marx points out, the process of consumption isn't simply a process of consumption, it's also a process of production. As we consume, we produce ourselves. We produce ourselves, in other words, what do we really produce in terms of the circuit? We produce our labor power, ready to sell again. But we spend our, we have some part of our labor power, we actually use for the process of consumption. Now we have to wash and walk to work and cook and all those things. 
whether you, even, even somebody who has a total slavish wife, who even wipes his bottom for him, still has to sleep for himself, still has to chew for himself, he still has to be at the, the notion that the worker doesn't contribute at all to the value of his own labor power, and the most sexist household is ridiculous. He has to get himself to work, and so on and so on. So, and finally, the labor power is sold, and the worker gets money again. We have this circuit, okay? Now, the two circuits intersect, of course, and the second diagram shows the intersection of the two, because there's two places where the circuit of capital intersects with the circuit of labor power. Okay? There's the sale of labor power to the capitalist, and there's the purchase of means of consumption, articles of consumption from the capitalist. Now, one of the things about this second circuit, which is worth commenting on, though, is, of course, that it is a circuit of production. Not simply a circuit of consumption, it is a circuit in which something crucial to capitalist production is itself produced. Labour power is produced, the capacity to work, all our human powers and so on are revived and refreshed and so on, developed. Outside the circuit of immediate capitalist production, in this other circuit, which intersects with the first one. And the second thing about this circuit, it is not under the direct sway of capital. When you leave the workplace, when you run, as you see workers running past the socialist worker seller from the workplace, <laughs> They are not any longer directly under the sway of capital. They're running away from capital, in fact. They're going home to another sphere of life. It's called sometimes private life and so on. Under whose direction are they? Fundamentally, they're under their own. The other sphere of production is not under the immediate sway of capital, it's under the sway of the worker. Of course, with all the limitations that are placed on by capital, capital is never absent from the situation. The immediate, direct, driver of the second circuit of production is the worker, him or herself, or the working class, drives the second one. And the second thing we have to say about these two circuits is that they are opposed to each other, because the motive force of the circuit of capital is, the cumul is accumulation. The accumulation of capital, we all know that, that's the motive force of the circuit of capital, but what about the circuit of labour power? What is the motive force of the circuit of labour power? Well, to cut a, a, an argument short, and without trying to document it in terms of various remarks that Marx makes at different points in different writings, including the Grundriss and the Economic Philosophical Manuscripts and so on, the fundamental driving circuit is the self-development of the worker. It is the worker's own needs, and the worker's own conception of the worker's own needs and so on, which are the motive force of that second circuit. And as we all know, our own self-development brings us into conflict with capital. Now, Marx does have something to say in Capital about the meeting of the two needs. It's called the most readable chapter in Volume 1. It's called The Working Day. Capital needs to extend the working day for the worker because it wants to expand the extraction of absolute surplus value in the 1830s, 1840s, the period you know, before the, the early period of the 19th century. It describes this beautifully. Capital's hunger for more of the worker's time, more of the worker's energy. That, and capital, because it's bought labor power, has the right to do so. In terms of bourgeois rights, the capitalist has every right to exploit the worker too. <coughs> but the worker's also got a right, and the right is inscribed in, in the worker's circuit, the right to develop him or herself. And that, of course, requires to develop yourself, you must have time and energy and so on. And in the question of the working days is marked, two rights, opposed rights, can't come into total conflict. And between two rights, two, two rights is as forced to size. And then he shows how, actually, the, the process of the legislation over the working day is actually resolved through the, the conflict between the classes in, in Britain, through Parliament and so on and so on. But behind, you see, behind that conflict, there is something which he hasn't analysed, which is why the worker has a right in the first place, what the character of the worker's right is, and so on. And it seems to me we need that other circuit, in a sense, to give it simple theoretical con consolidation. Now, you don't have to have it in form of a circle on a piece of scrappy paper from National Polytechnic. I don't mean that. You need the idea there. And the reason we need the idea there is because otherwise we're in danger of seeing capital in the wrong term. We're in danger of misunderstanding the book called Capital. We're in danger of misunderstanding capitalism. See, Marx argued, there's a famous remark of his, he says, capital is not a thing but a social relationship. And everybody always quotes it. Uh, it's not a thing but a social relationship. But then you have to ask, well, what sort of social relationship in particular is it? And of course we say, as Marxists, of course it's fundamentally it's a social relationship of class conflict. The heart of the process of capitalism is a process of class conflict. 
But what Marx gives us most of all in volumes one, two, and three is the capitalist side of the class conflict. He doesn't really, in capital, develop the worker side of it. He doesn't develop the motive of the worker and conflict with capital and so on. In other words, the book on wage labor is needed. I mean, I don't mean, you know, if only he lived long enough to write it, but the idea of the class struggle is not immediately apparent throughout the work, and it needs to be for us to understand it properly. And, and things can, beautiful, wonderful writers can misunderstand capital in the sense. There's a marvelous book by Harry Braverman called Labor and Monopoly Capital, which is all about machinery and, and the changing and, the, and technology and the capitalist use of technology to exploit the workers. And many of the best critics of Harry Braverman have said, marvelous advance to bring all this out, but you've left the workers out. Where's the workers' response to new technology? Where's the struggle over the new technology? The, the reply of the workers to the employers, the battle over the question of technology, it's missing from your book. It's only half the picture. Marx's capital was an unfinished work, and Harry Braverman follows capital beautifully in his book. He follows the work, the written, published work of Marx beautifully in the book, and he doesn't get it because, in a sense, he hasn't read capital critically enough, you might say. And yet, I mean, I'm not in any way wanting to say, don't read Harry Braverman, because every comrade can, it's a beautifully written book, and everybody should read it, but it's one-sided. So, what would the contents of this missing book be? <laughs> Silly question. You know, what, is, what, would, what are the contents of the, of the ghost? Um, I mean, just some illustrations of the sorts of things it would have to deal with. It would have to talk about the historical development of workers, the process of the development of the self-development of the working class. It would have to talk about the forms of life of workers under capital, as in, in some sort of theoretical way. I don't know how, how it's to be done. I mean, I, I don't wish to be too bold and say how it is to be done, but that it needs to be done in, as part of the whole project seems to be obvious. You have to take account of the, the development of the working class family, of relationships between workers and the family. You have to take account of the development of trade unions and co-ops and so on and so on, the different forms of organization of workers, the different forms of struggle of workers. It would have to present this in a way that showed the conflict between workers and capital at the heart of the self-development of workers. The growth of workers, the defeats of workers, the victories of workers, in a sense, would have to be described at least in theoretical terms. In the way that Marx talks about the example of the working day, they'd have to be great, we'd have to have more than examples. The whole thing would have to be theorized in a sense. And one other thing that we'd have to take account, because of course, if, if, if Marx had lived long enough to write it, you know, it might have been 1990 by the time he got round to finishing the, the, entire, the entire project, after all, um, he'd have to take account the whole series of developments in the 20th century, which of course wouldn't in the 19th century, although they were already implicit in the 19th century, like the socialization of the wage. The whole tendency for part of the real wage packet of the worker, no longer to come in the form of money in the little brown envelope, but also to come in the form of various social services which are given to, which the working class wins in a sense from capital as part of a whole complicated reformist deal involving the state. You know, the National Health Service and all those things, but the so partial socialization of the wage, what Barbara Castle once, not unwittingly, not unwittingly called the social wage, would also have to be a part of that whole process of the account, but the whole process of the development. And in other words, it would go beyond some of the things that Marx himself has to say about the wage form itself. Okay. So overall, volume four of Capital would have to be a theoretical history of labor. A theoretical history of labor as active, not simply as suffering, not simply as exploited, but as struggling. And that would transform our understanding of the book Capital in some ways enrich it, and it would, it would even transform individual concepts. I'll well, really give an example, the concept of accumulation. What is accumulation? Well, suddenly we would see accumulation is the class struggle. Not some technical process which, in, which only Marxist economists are interested in. The process of accumulation is a way of saying the class struggle, because accumulation occurs against the resistance of workers, etc., etc. It isn't simply a technical, econo a technical economic process, as it were. It's got nothing to do with life. It's, some, it's actually, the heart of it is actually the class struggle. It implies, it entails the class struggle, if you like. And one last thing, see, Marx's capital, we all know, and yet a lot of the time when you read it, you're not sure that you lose a sense of it. It is, after a while, an argument for communism, an argument for socialism. It would be much more obvious 
collective sense, if we read it as a work about class struggle, and that's really what I'm arguing for, to see that there is a connection between, and between Marx's argument about capitalism and Marx's argument about socialism. Because in a sense, the, the remarks he makes about socialism don't flow out of the stuff we've got directly. You don't have a sense, oh, it logically entails socialism. Because the active element, the creative element, the, the element that will create socialism, the working class, isn't present in capital a lot of the time as a really active creative force. So we need volume four. Okay, that's where I cease to steal from Michael Leibovitz, and now I become slightly less coherent. But um, <laughs> uh, one last remark, though, about volume four, or whatever number you want to give it, is that clearly it will be a very long book. Because, you know, certainly it's going to be written in the 20th century, it will have to encompass the whole history of the working class for the last 100 years. So in some theoretical scheme, and with lots of illustrations and liveliness and all the wit and, and humour of Marx and the marvellous footnotes and all the rest of it, no wonder he never got around to writing it, but you know, it might run to five actual books on the shelf. So uh, that's volume four. Okay, now we come to volume five. <laughs> okay, the state. Now the subtitle of Marx's Capital is A Critique of Political Economy. And one of the things that that title reminds us of is that Marx couldn't write capital except during a long engagement, a grappling with the ideas of such writers as Smith and Ricardo and Malthus and so on, the previous generation of bourgeois political economists. But they were political economists, and I'll explain the significance of this. You see, a lot of, if you read a modern history of economics textbook, those guys are always treated as early economists. But Adam Smith, for example, was clear that, I mean, in, in those people's time, this is less true perhaps of Ricardo, but for Adam Smith it's very clear. He was not an economist. I mean, apart from anything else, Adam Smith wrote books on moral philosophy and the, the theory of astronomy and aesthetics and all sorts of things. He was a, he was a totalist, if you like. He was into everything. Um, he, he was a, no, I can't say a bourgeois Marxist, that's it. but he had the interest that we have, you know, the range of interests that we have. He was concerned with everything. I mean, his view of political economy was it's a branch, he said, of the science of legislation, of how society ought to be governed, in other words. And political economy is a branch of a, of a larger science. And certainly the aim of all those classical guys, which is certainly not the aim of uh, modern economists, the, the aim of those great guys of the past was to grasp what Hegel called the totality. Get hold of everything and see how it all fits together. And Marx wrote a critique of them, remember. Not of uh, Schumpeter or um, some econometrician from Manchester Polytechnic or something. He was a critic of the political economists, of the big guys. And the centre of his attack on them was also, what, what was central to his attack on them, was also central to other people than people who call themselves political economy. It was a notion, and I, here I'm not sure I'm right, but I think I am, that political philosophy also had the same sort of notion at its heart in the 17th and 18th centuries. You know, the, the tradition that Marx criticised has some things in common with the political economy, crucial assumptions. <laughs> And I'll sum it up by saying that they saw everything that was new in the world. I mean, all of them were trying to describe this new world of capitalism that was emerging. And they saw at the center of it something derived from what they called nature. The state of nature is a common phrase which they use. Something natural outside society explains society. And part of the center of Marx's attack on them is that notion of nature. Time and again, what's sometimes called natural law, the whole natural law tradition. It wasn't time to develop it very much, but um, the thing about seeing capitalism as emerging out of nature is, of course, that if you, do, if you see it as emerging out of nature, you see it as eternal. It's fixed. It's natural. You, know, I mean, you, wouldn't, you don't curse the weather in the same way that you curse that I mean, you curse the weather, but, you know, quite honestly, you're done. Um, in, the present, in, in this technological era, anyway, maybe one day you know, we'll blast it over, but um, for the moment, uh, in our own epoch, it's pointless to, to curse the weather, you have, like Hegel, to learn to be at home with it. Um, but the world of... they saw, the we they saw, in a sense their argument was the weather is really of the same order of phenomenon as society. And we have to grasp society essentially as emanating out of nature, which means, for all intents and purposes, it's unchangeable and eternal. <laughs> 
And Marx's, the center of Marx's critique of bourgeois, what he called bourgeois political economy was that they couldn't see beyond the, the, the limits of the existing. They always tried to make the present seem eternal. Now, and his argument, we have to see, hence the importance of the notion of modes of production, amongst other things, we have to see the present as part of history, and a history that hasn't finished yet. There's a future which is going to be different from the present. Whatever it's like is going to be different from the present. Now, from Hegel, particularly from Hegel, Marx got the idea that the modern society is divided into two spheres of activity. One is called civil society, and it's the world, very broadly, the economy. And the second, actually Hegel further distinguished between civil society and the family. I, I, I don't want to pursue that one, it might have implications or not, I don't know. But on the one hand you have the world of private life, if you like. On the other hand you have the world of public life, the state. There's a distinction between the private and the public. And Hegel tried to theorize, I don't want to talk about Hegel, but Hegel tried to theorize a way in which you could hold the thing, the two together in harmony. Now, the truth is that if you look at Marx's intellectual career, the whole of society, he makes it very clear in the, his early writings, he, the whole of society is to be understood as civil society and the state. But then from 1844 onwards, what does he really devote the rest of his life to? Civil society. Capital is about civil society. It's about the move. It's, it's crucial that you should start that side, and he gives the arguments in the 1840s as to why you have to start with the understanding of civil society in order to understand the state. But where he's in, as a very young guy in his 20s, he is criticized, I think he's, yes, in his mid 20s, he's holding the two in tension. He begins to set the state aside as a problem to be returned to one day. When I'm 93, you know, I'll return to sort of thing. But meanwhile, I must solve the problem, because what the key thing is the mistake in the past of the revolutionaries in the past, they've tried to solve the problem of modern society by attacking the question of the state. We've got to turn the direct attention in the opposite direction. We've got to focus on one side of the question. And he devotes the rest of his life to writing capital, a critique of political economy. But in terms of his own starting point, he's not talking about the whole of society. There's still something else to be talked about. He's got to go back and then talk about the state. Otherwise he won't have a picture of the whole society, of the totality, the other half, the other sphere. Now, uh, you know, it's, very, it's infuriating. If you're interested in the Marxist theory of the state, it is infuriating to read Marx. Because you think, you know, I was reading through you know, some of the early writings in the last few weeks and, and finding time and again the possibilities that there are there that he would develop the idea of the state. And he drops it because he's developing something else all the time. His attention is turning away. His career goes off in a particular direction. Now, the 17th and 18th century philosophers, political philosophers, and the political economists for that matter, made a great theoretical achievement. They saw that the question of the state was rooted in the question of private property. It's clear in Hobbes, it's clear in Locke, it's clear in Rousseau, it's clear in, in Hegel, it's clear in Adam Smith. Adam Smith's absolutely clear uh, that the state exists for the protection of property against those who haven't got them. It's a class state. I mean, Adam Smith is wonderfully radical. You know, before the idea is a radical one, it's not yet a subversive idea, he can be honest about it. He says the state is there to protect the property of the rich, against the poor, and they envy and they want. Um, they're quite clear the state is rooted in private property. But, of course, they then theorize private property as being natural. It, 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 it's something that arises naturally out of the relationship between the individual person and nature. Now, and they saw the natural as being the end of history. We couldn't criticize civil society in the way that Marx was to do. But of course, we know that uh, private property is not natural. You know, the, all the wealth of knowledge we have from being Marxists and from the modern discoveries in sociology and social anthropology and so on and so on, private property ain't natural, it's historical. It hasn't always existed, and fingers crossed, isn't always going to exist. Fingers crossed, and there's a bit of activity isn't going to always exist. Sorry, I have to get my <coughs> politics right here. Now, the thing about natural, if, you see, if private property isn't natural, then it's got presuppositions. It's got social presuppositions, and also it's got political presuppositions. Quite clear to the classical political philosophers, private property can't exist without a state to uh, protect it. And you need to develop those presuppositions. We need, if we want to understand private property, first of all, we want to understand the starting point of capital, we want to understand the commodity and private pro all the private property relations embodied in that and so on. If we want to understand it properly, we've got to go back to it and look at another side of it, the, its presuppositions. 
Got to look at the state. Now, how do we do it? Private property, I'm going to start off back to the little pictures, the right hand of the sheet now. I'm going to say basically, we need to understand what private property is. And I'll just make a single distinction, just to start us off, and then you can forget about the pictures again. There are two sorts of notions of private property. And the first one is what I, I mean, the language is probably wrong. I mean, if somebody can suggest better language to me afterwards, I'd be grateful. I don't like this, I can't remember where I got it from. But one sort of private property if you, is what I call segmental private property. Imagine, for example, a world of peasant farms with very little exchange and so on between them. Each peasant family with its plot, or, or perhaps villages, producing everything they need. The land belongs to them. Nobody else has got any rights to their land from outside, and they don't need anybody outside, and they don't have any relationship with, their, with anybody outside. That blacksmith is there, got a bit of iron to make a few nails and, and so on. But basically, everything is encompassed in their little world, and they don't need any connections with the outside world. That's as far as the rest of the world is concerned, the rest of the world needn't exist, but also as far as the, world is, the rest of the world is concerned, their world is private. The relationship between the, per the people in that society and the things they have, that's all there is. Okay? That's segmental private property. You have a whole world of separated <coughs> villages or, until the 16th century, continents. You know, There was a world of private property called the Americas, there was another one called Eurasia. They didn't even know the other one existed. No connection between them at all until the 15th century, when that idiot Columbus unified the world by mistake and discovered there was a bit in between Portugal and Asia. Now, the other form is what I call organic private property. I mean, I do suggest it, but you know, you understand, I'm not hung on the terms, but here we've got a different situation. You see, here we've got people who've got property in things, lots of people with property in things, these are little. The dotted lines are their fences, if you like, around their gardens, or around their farms, or around their property, with signs on them saying, no trespassing, keep out, private property, etc. But the trouble they have is that what they need is always, is not only what they've got, because of the division of labour developing in society, what they also need is what's next door, and what's over the boundary. They need things that other people own, and everybody needs things that other people own. So you've got private property based on the division of labor, which is, of course, the center of the notion of you know, the private property system that characterizes capitalism. We need what we ain't got. Now, so it's that one which interests us. And, and there you've got a situation where there's a bond between people and the things they need, but also a separation between people and the things that they need. And as I say, the world is really constituted of, a, a whole world is covered with fences and signs saying, no trespassing, private property, no admittance except on business, etc., etc. And for production to occur in such a society, this is the problem, for production to occur in a society like this, the second one, in other words, modern society, above all, those fences have got to be overcome, and they've also got to be preserved. If they're overcome but not preserved, that's the end of private property, because then you've got your communalized property. You simply say, well, I need that, I'll have it. Um, on the other hand, um, if uh, you don't overcome the fences, then production collapses, because produ modern production depends on enormous interdependence between. In other words, we're talking about interdependence between people. And the solution which is established, I mean, this is terribly artificial to present this all in terms of the elaboration of concepts, but this is the way that Marx talks about, in a way that he works. The solution to this problem that is arrived at is the solution of exchange and contract that um, you can climb over the fence and have something from the next field, if you like, a turnip, when you've got parrots, you can have a turnip provided you make an agreement with the owner of the turnip, that you'll give him so many carrots for his turnip, or something to represent those uh, turnips, money, or those carrots, money. And you have to, for, to preserve those things, as well as keep them, you have to make very special things called contracts, and there was a what they're not is what occurred in the Godfather. You have to make offers that people can refuse. Okay? Because otherwise, it's not, you're not really making a contract. If, if you come along, if I say to Don, Ron, yeah. Conrad, um, <laughs> sorry, we only met once, um, you know, give me your wallet. And he says, uh, I'll sell you. 
You know, that's contract. But if I say give it to you, I'll shoot you. That's not a contractual relationship. That's called an offer you can't refuse. Now, you, the world is constituted in capitalism a series of offers you can refuse. Uh, you have to respect the right of the other person to his private property and so on. Now, so emerges a world which Marx characterized in a joke as being the world of freedom, equality, property, and Jeremy Bentham, was the way he put it in Capital. Everybody is free to do with their own what they like. They can say yes or no to the offer. They're free to starve or live. They can do as they wish. Everybody is formally equal. You can't have contracts between the unequals. People are legally equal. Everybody has some sort of property because you've got to have something to exchange in order to live in such a society. And everybody, following Jeremy Bentham, looks after their own self-interest. So it was the world of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. The world of people who are independent and interdependent at the same time. Now that implies something, you see, that implies the existence of rights. Now, there's a whole philosophical discussion about what rights are, and I'm not going to go into that because I don't know it. Fortunately for me, it's terribly useful at times to be ignorant. And uh, I'm just going to say that a right is a claim to something which you can enforce. Now, the question is, how do you enforce rights to your private property? And I want to say there are two methods of doing so. One method we'll call club law. You walk around your fence every night with a big club, making sure nobody's climbing over. Or you walk around your perimeter every night with an international intercontinental ballistic missile, making sure that nobody climbs over. You, know, you can do it with an army, you can do it in, in the American West, you know, get off my land. Uh, a few cried, that, sorry about this, uh, the American comrades, uh, for the accent. Uh, the gun law. It is gun law, it is club law, it is international law, or lawlessness. The principle is might is right. You defend your own property with such physical resources that as you can to prevent other people from invading your property. That's one method, which is perfectly feasible. And that way you can have a system of rights, sometimes through the feud and so on. It's a perfectly feasible, for a period, historical method, and it has a part to play in history. It's a method of protecting uh, rights, of maintaining a system of private property. The other method... Oh, sorry, one other thing to say about it is that it is like the value of commodities, it is determined by social necessity. If all your neighbours have got machine guns, it's no good having a bow and arrow. You have, the, the level of your club, as it were, in club law, has to be determined by what all the other clubs are. There is social necessity in it, just as there is. And so you have to, the costs of producing, in a sense, to participate in that society, involve some expenditure on clubs, or whatever is the equivalent. Now, that's one possibility. The other one is the state. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to finish here, and I've left out most of the development of this, but you'll have to excuse that. The other method is the state. And here what we're saying is that the, essentially what's involved is that the defense of your rights falls to a third party, who's not you, but somebody above you and outside you, who uh, has got the power to defend the rights of all. And the state is a third party in the relationship. You haven't just got two people exchanging with each other, Actually, in every contract, there is this third party, often missing from legal theory. It isn't a relationship between two of contract, it's actually a relationship between two plus, the state. The state stands over the rest of society. It's a special interest within the division of labor. Now, something which is underdeveloped in Marx and underdeveloped in our tradition, but which needs to be developed, and which is an implication of this, and which is one of the ways that the book on the state, if you like, would have to go, is that the state itself is exploitative in its relationship with society. Now, the basis of the relationship between the state and the citizens is the state must subsist. It has to live by some means, while it's not itself, at least at the starting point of the analysis, it's not a producer, after all. It's something which exists to protect producers from each other. That's the, the Hobbesian starting point, in a sense. How is it to live? By taxes, is the answer, fundamentally, by tribute and taxes. We have a new element introduced. We, actually, we haven't gone any further than the assumptions of Chapter 1, Volume 1 of Capital. All we've assumed is commodity production. Actually, there's, see, commodity production implies equality between people. Everything is valued equally uh, in commodity production. But now we have a different kind of economic relationship introduced to com complicate the picture. As soon as we go to the book on the state, we have another kind of relationship, which is not a relationship of equality. You are not equal to the state in a tax relationship. 
you pay or they hit you over the head, is the relationship with the state. And there's another kind of relationship now built in, which is assumptions are different. And indeed they are, from the beginning, they're the assumptions of class. That one section of society extracts resources from another because the other section of society can't run its own life. The assumptions of alienation are all built in to, into that uh, situation. We have a duality in economic relations from the beginning of the analysis now. The relations of equality, of commodity production and so on, which are implied in, in commodity production, are those fundamentally of abstract equality. Now we have another set of relations which are the relations necessarily, right from the beginning of the analysis, of inequality. Now, so the focus on the commodity isn't an adequate starting point, as a matter of fact, uh, for capital. For the complete picture, we actually have to go back and we have to complicate that in a different kind of way uh, and elaborate out in this sort of way. Now, I, there's a whole number of things. I didn't know how much I was going to be able to talk about. And uh, there's a whole number of further development that would obviously need to take place. Because in the end, what we have to arrive at is a picture of world capitalism, which is, interestingly, a combination of the two methods of regulation, of political regulation, club law and state. Why it's like that, you cannot explain. I'll just end really by saying that you can't explain why world capitalism has the form it has until you abandon Marx's starting point. This is the last problem, and I, 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 I wouldn't have given this talk until I suddenly solved this problem, that actually, finally, you have to abandon Marx's starting point. Because what he does is his method. To arrive at the modern world, you have, uh, to arrive at cap real capitalism, you have at a certain point to abandon his method, and you have to forget Hegel. Uh, Marx was very influenced by Hegel in the way he wrote the first three volumes of Capital. By the time he got to the end, he would have had to kick Hegel out the window. For this reason. See, when I started, I said,